brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hey, hoop heads, wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Ten years down the road, when these kids are adults and they come and talk with us, they're not going to talk to us about the wins and losses. They're going to talk to us about the things that matter the most to them, and it's about connection and being with those athletes in a way where they look up to you and you can speak life into them and you can show them an example, a positive example of how to be an adult. James Leith is the founder of Unleash the Athlete and former head of leadership and character development at IMG Academy. Leith is the mental performance coach for the Chicago Bulls. He's also the content guru and lead speaker for Changing the Game Project. James teaches mental strength skills and leadership development tools to athletes, coaches, and top performers through interactive lectures and team building activities. As a speaker, he uses stories, improvisation, audience participation, and lots of energy to provide an experience for the audience with clear takeaways for continued growth. Clinics like his Do, Say, Be formula for developing leaders and empowering them to take ownership in their personal development through goal setting, self-talk, commitment, and teamwork. Leith holds a bachelor's degree in communications from Fresno State and a master's degree in performance psychology from National University. He was a collegiate athlete at Fresno State and has coached multiple sports at the youth and high school levels. Thanks for checking out the Hoop Heads podcast. Our lineup of podcast guests includes some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. They'll share insights to help you grow as a coach, improve as a player, or enhance your experience of the game as a parent. You'll gain new perspectives on what the best coaches are doing, how they do it, and why they do it. We hope to make you think and challenge you to consider your approach to the game of basketball. Please subscribe to the Hoop Heads Pod and leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to the show. Help us grow the game by telling your friends and colleagues about the Hoop Heads podcast so they can give us a listen too. You'll want to have your pen and paper handy as you listen to this episode with James Leith, founder of Unleash the Athlete and mental performance coach of the Chicago Bulls. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here this morning without my co-host Jason Sunkel, but I am here with James Leith from Unleash the Athlete. James, welcome to the podcast. Hey man, it's good to hear from you. How Absolutely. Are you? <laughs> We're good. We're very good, good here. Uh, excited to have you on. I've uh, been a fan for quite a while. When I started writing my blog back in, I believe, 2014, discovered you through the Changing the Game Project and John O'Sullivan and been able to share a lot of the great things that you put out there for coaches at all levels. And so we're going to dig into some of that as we get deeper into the podcast. I want to start, though, by letting you uh, give people an idea of your background in sports, just so they have an idea of where you're coming from. So talk a little bit about your experience as a kid in sports and just how that's kind of shaped what you've done as an adult. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me on. I was um, a multi-sport athlete growing up. Uh, grade school was a bit of a troublemaker, had a, had a lot of energy. And when I found sports or sports found me, I found myself going to the principal's office a lot less because I didn't want to miss practice or a game or something and so it, it really helped me to 
kind of focus on my studies and not get in so much trouble. I graduated um, middle school, went into high school, and my father basically just said, you have two options. You can be on a team or you can have a job. And so I just went from sport to sport to sport. And I, I, I was in high school 20 something years ago. So that was a lot more possible than it is these days um, and acceptable. So I just, I just played a lot of sports in high school and uh, I would try out one and finish the season and decide, okay, I'm going to do something else next time. And I ended up at the end of high school, I had played at the varsity level in seven different sports. Wow. And I, I mean, I wasn't good at most of them, <laughs> but you know, the motivation to not have to deliver pizzas can actually provide a lot of, uh, um, desire to want to be on teams. No and doubt. So, so yeah, I, football was my main sport. Uh, I played basketball. I wrestled. I, uh, I, I played volleyball. I was, I was even on the competition cheer team for a, a minute just to kind of, um, help the, the girls go to competitions and we did stunts and stuff. It was a lot of fun and went to college to play ball, uh, football and I walked on and limped off. As I like to say, uh, barely had time for a cup of coffee and I got hurt pretty bad, but the cheer team picked me up because of my experience in high school and they paid my scholarship and I ended up being the mascot at Fresno state for a couple of years, which was a, a blessing in disguise. The first year I was bummed because I wasn't playing ball. But then the second year I realized that I had made a, a name for myself as an athlete. And so as the mascot, I would, I would be in the huddle during the basketball games at Fresno State or during the football games and, and the wrestling matches because they knew I wasn't actually messing around. I was, I was interested. So I got this front row seat to all these great coaches at Fresno State for years because uh, I, I was invited and I was able to, to stand there and, and, and listen what was going on. I immediately started coaching. Uh, I actually ended up playing football uh, at, during college and after college, uh, semi-pro level and arena football. But uh, I, I knew coaching was where it was at for me. And so I took all those experiences being on all those teams and being with the good coaches and the bad coaches and, and started coaching. And I loved it. I, I loved it. Every aspect about coaching, except game day. I just, the strategy, the, uh, I got to put this player in and this play, I, that stuff just, I didn't, I didn't like it, but I loved <laughs> being in the locker room. I loved being on the bus. I loved tryouts. I loved practice. I loved the, the culture and building team and, and helping coaches to, to build up athletes. And I, I realized that's, that's my strength. And so I went out back to school and I got my master's in performance psychology and committed to being a resource to coaches instead of being an actual. Now, I still coach youth, but basketball and football. But when it comes to rising up in the ranks of high school and college and, and the pros, I just know my strength. and My strength is being a resource. And that's where I'm at today. It's a really interesting story, I think, especially when you juxtapose it with the way that, unfortunately, a lot of our kids are growing up today. Here's you having played seven varsity sports, and now, in a lot of cases, we're asking seven- and eight-year-olds to specialize and play soccer or basketball year-round. And so I'm just curious to kind of get your take on the sports specialization discussion that's out there and just how playing all those sports – impacted you and then with the idea here that think about how a kid who has to specialize at eight or nine what you think that does to them emotionally physically uh just just why it's so important to play multiple sports well i think it it's it we're, we're in a very unfortunate situation where we're not listening to science and we're not listening to the professional athletes who are telling us and over and over, play multiple sports. I've been blessed to work at the, the highest level in uh, the Olympics and professional sports with athletes one-on-one, -on -one, with teams. And more often than not, those athletes at the professional level will tell you they played multiple sports up until their sophomore, junior, even senior year. Some of them were dual, dual sport athletes in college. And this isn't 20 years ago. This is three years ago. This is last year. This is 
you look at golfers, the top golfers in the world right now, we're multiple sport athletes. And we have parents who are ignoring science and who are ignoring anecdotal evidence that they're ruining their children by forcing them to play one sport all year long. And I, I was at IMG Academy for a while as the head of leadership development. And a big misconception about IMG is that all those kids are single sport athletes. Those kids, most of them come to IMG for a year or two as multiple sport athletes to focus on one sport. But they're sophomores, juniors, seniors. They, they, they had already played multiple sports. And so they, it's, it's a misnomer to think that, oh, okay, that you were just born to be a baseball player. That's false. We were born to be active. We're born to develop. And so the, the eight, the eight year olds that I've, I've had conversations with, I've never met a, an eight year old that says, I just want to play one sport. It's, if you dig down deep, it's always pushed by the parents and the parents think that they're doing well. So I, I don't mean to throw them under the bus, but they do need to get hit by the bus like, because <laughs> yeah, the, absolutely. The, the science flies in the face of their, so, you know how in the gym there's bro science? It's like, man, you got to drink like six eggs and you got to do this and 12 sets of that. There's all this stuff and it flies in the face of actual science. Well, we got parent science too. Well, these parents are saying you got to be on this club. You got to do this and you have to sacrifice this kid's childhood for the hope of a scholarship. And by the time the kid gets to college, they don't want to play soccer anymore. They don't want to play baseball anymore. That There's nothing. And the other thing is, Mike, is that these uh, recruiters from college are looking for the multiple sport athletes. They're not looking for single sport athletes. You get a baseball player that's played nothing but baseball until their senior year. That recruiter's like, that's it. Why well, can't I can't? We can't teach you anything. You 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 know everything. So the psychology of playing one sport teaches a kid that they know everything. So they can't be taught when they get to college. It's a big problem. But if like for me, when I was playing multiple sports. When I played basketball, well, that made me be able to get the jump ball as a receiver. When I wrestled, that made me a better ball carrier. When I played volleyball, that just made me meet people that I would have never spoken to before. Right, <laughs> because right. Because it's a completely different type of athlete. And if we had a pool, I would have I would have been a swimmer. So I think we're doing a huge disservice to any young athlete saying, you have to do this. It's very similar to saying, you're going to be... Uh, a doctor you're going to be a painter you're going to be a dentist and this 10 year old is like i just want to play with clay <laughs> All right like can i go draw something no you can't because we've got to go to you're going to be the best violinist the world's ever seen and the kid's like i would rather throw the baseball around you know so we're we're teaching these kids that they're they're fixed for the rest of their life in this one sport and then we think that they're going to be creative in other avenues and they're not because they're learning about life from adults. And when the adults, I feel like I'm standing up on a soapbox right now, but when the adults tell them you are this type of athlete, that permeates through the rest of their psyche. And I'm a fixed person. This is what I'm supposed to do. And there's no deviating from this plan that mom and dad have set for me. And I also think that the danger there is that it becomes their complete identity and as a result, if the success that the parent foresees for the kid or that the outside world sees for the kid doesn't materialize, it can be, that can be really, really difficult on a kid's psyche. And the biggest problem that I always have with the sports specialization is, is, you know, twofold. One that you talked about is, you know, parents. And then I think there's also that pressure from, you know, clubs high school coaches and there's people obviously doing it all different kinds of ways and there's people that do it right. But unfortunately there's a lot of people out there that put pressure as adults on kids to specialize and not just parents talking more about on the coaching side of it. And I think that that's where the danger comes in where it's the adult, whether it's a parent or a coach making the decision for the child. Now if the child says, as, as you pointed out, they get to IMG and they're in 10th grade and they want to be only a basketball player or only a tennis player by that point, those kids have a pretty good idea of what they like, what they don't like, and what their goals are going to be. But a seven or eight year old 
doesn't have that same life experience and understanding and they haven't been exposed to as many things and so i think that's the danger is when adults start dictating to kids what they should be doing as opposed to the adult as you said listening to the kid and just kind of getting a feel for what they want to do there are very few kids in my experience that are eight nine ten years old that want to spend three or four nights a week and you know all weekend doing one activity now there are some there's a there's a one percent a half a percent whatever that of kids that are like that but 99.5 percent of kids would rather as you said be drawing or be running around or just playing with their friends and not being in this high pressure environment that we kind of force them into and that's it's a challenge it's out there for everybody for sure well yeah well the, the parents are they're, they're doing what they think is good for the correct kid, but they're not looking at it as a, from, from a long-term perspective one of the things that I've seen over the last 20 years is that youth sports has become the same entertainment that professional sports is. And there's a lot of different issues that stem from looking at professional athletes and then applying those principles and their psychological level to 10-year-olds. When you get to the professional level, whether you're dealing with female or male athletes, their psyche is very similar. And the the similarities between the, the male sports and the female sports is, is just it's there, there's not a lot of difference but then when you apply that down and you compare a six-year-old female athlete to a six-year-old male athlete the similarities aren't there anymore like <laughs> what right. we've done is we've come down and we're like oh yeah well if it works at the professional level you got the women's soccer team and the men's soccer team professional level let's apply those same principles to these eight-year-old children and it's just, it's not applicable right there. And you, you take a professional practice schedule and then you try to implement that with 11 year olds. It's like, no, 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 no. Like when I'm with the Bulls, there's a, there's, it's an hour practice or a 45 minute practice and they get in and they get out. That's not a 12 year old's experience. They, 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 they're just not that focused. Plus they're not getting paid millions of dollars to be the basketball player. And so you have to implement a little bit more fun and you have to have, have some activities. And I know you and I have talked about the different activities that I've, I've put up and you use them and that gets them to love the sport. And All so, right. So give us, give us one or give us one or two of your activities, team building that you can do with a youth sports team that's going to add to the fun that's going to make them enjoy being a part of the team that's going to make their practices more beneficial in your mind what are a couple of good ones that you like that you've used to great success well so the, i think we, we start with why do we use activities at these lower levels and the why is because these kids are at school all day and they're dealing with the pressures of classes and homework and relationships and tiktok status and all this <laughs> stuff that is is really just like emotionally bogging them down. They need to get to practice. And then the coach is like, all right, you need to just forget everything that just happened and focus completely on basketball. Or it's right here. It's baseball. No more messing around. And that's not how a child works. That's not how human beings work. There has to be some kind of switch where they go from being that student to being in that playful athlete mind. We don't want our kids to be childish, but we want them to be childlike and have fun. We want them to be playful. And that's at, at the highest level. When you watch a, a LeBron James or you watch like someone who is enjoying the game, they're at their top performance level. So that's where it's the same as kids. When kids are having fun, they're going to play better. And so when they get to practice, what I like to do is, because I still coach youth sports, and I, when I teach the coaches is there's got to be some kind of switch. So, for example, kids come to practice. They've got music in the locker room. So they're having fun. They know practice starts at 315 and they have to be on the court by 310. They get on the court. They have a couple minutes to adjust to being on the court. Now the music goes off and we play some kind of game or do some kind of activity that activates their playful world. Silly things like rock, paper, scissors, cheerleaders. That's probably my favorite. Have you ever, have you done that one yet? I have. So, okay. I, me, so I'll tell you the story. So I, I've done it. I've done it with like mostly the coaching that I do now is with my own my own kids. So 
I've done it with every one of their teams. But I did do it one time uh, when I was given a, a workshop for the Positive Coaching Alliance. And since I started the podcast, I haven't been able to do nearly as many workshops as I did. But I learned of the activity. I think I actually saw you do it in a video online. And I took it with a group of adults who were base, recreational, uh, recreational basketball coaches. And there was probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 people in the room. And, you know, you're giving your presentation and you're trying to be engaging and people are, people are engaged, but not to the degree that they were once you get them up and doing rock, paper, scissors. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. You, you wouldn't have, I mean, I'm sure you would have believed it because you've done it many, many times. But the fact of what these adults, how they go about getting into the activity, it was, it was incredible. So go ahead and share what exactly it is. So I did this activity uh, at uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore, a couple weeks ago when school first started. And I had 600 athletes in that first, the day before their first day of school. And I cut them in half. So I got 300 on one side, 300 on the other side. And I say, partner up. So they partner up. And I say, I'm going to turn the music on. And you're going to play rock, paper, scissors. Two, best two out of three. And I walk them through. I show, okay, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And I say, but don't speed through it. When you win, celebrate. When you lose, recognize that you lost. Get ready, shake it off, and then go at it again. Whoever loses becomes the cheerleader for the winner. And now it's like their hype person. So now their hype person is going to go and find them the next battle. And so then they take their person over there and then they, their champion wins that match again. So now they've got uh, four people in their um, hype group. And you go around and eventually you've got one champion from one side, one champion from the other side. And the energy in the room is blowing off the ceiling. It's, it's, it's going absolutely nuts and it's a lot of fun and the music's going. And so I make a big deal out of bring me your champion and bring me your champion. And they come in and everybody's cheering and we go best two out of three and we go one, two, three, shoot. And they shoot. One team has one point. The other team has zero. They're celebrating high. And the other team is like, oh, we're going to be all right. And the energy in the room is so crazy. Finally, when that, when somebody wins, Everybody celebrates, you shake hands, they get, they're all excited, you get them lined up, and now you can teach them anything you want because they're ready. You taught them a few things. You taught them that it's okay to celebrate your teammates. It's okay to be excited in a culture where being excited is looked at as, oh man, just calm down, you're too excited. You know, It's like, no, 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 nothing great ever happened without enthusiasm. So let's practice enthusiasm. What happens is that you can use this, and I use this when I work with teams, as an anchor to when you're at halftime a couple weeks from now, you can go, remember the energy that you had during that rock, paper, scissors, cheerleader activity? Close your eyes, find that energy, and let's go out in the second half and do some damage to this team. Like, let's, let's go all out. And so they remember that experience. And so that's just one of many activities that you can do to get these kids in a childlike state ready to play. Instead of just assuming that after 30 minutes of warming up and doing all this stuff and just quietness in the gym, that the kids are just going to turn it on and be like, yeah, let's go. Let's be all, let's go all out. That's not how people work. And so you got to get them excited, give them a reason to, to kind of dig deep and go, yeah, I'm going to go all out in practice. It's, it's great. I mean, anybody who's out there listening, I've done it with, like I said, all my teams since I learned about it, I've done it on a bigger scale. It's so much fun. Like I have an older daughter who right now she's in 10th grade. And so she's played AAU basketball with the same group of girls now for, and I think three years. And after the first time we did it, like it was inevitable that in the next practice or the next practice, somebody on that team is coming up to me saying, Hey, can we, can we play rock, paper, scissors again, coach? <laughs> can we do that again? And that's yeah. when you know that you've hit on an activity that, that they like. And that it's, I mean, that's all part of what makes things special it really is when you can get them to bond together to be a part of it and it just leaves everybody with a smile on their face and then to your point you're able to then go back and you're able to reference it and that really makes all the difference head start basketball along with members of the j billis skills camp staff will be hosting the very first prime skills camp an affiliate of the j billis skills camp that is held annually in charlotte north carolina Prime Skills Camp will take place on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, J. 
just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, June 26th through the 28th, and will be designed for boys rising to grades 6 through 9. Prime Skills Camp will mirror the J. Billis Skills Camp in daily programming, teaching, coach to camper ratio, and quality of instruction. Prime Skills Camp brings all of the team-oriented individual instruction, focus on the fundamentals, and high-level coaching to young men aspiring to a high school varsity basketball experience. This camp is operated by Billis Camp veterans and includes the J. Billis Coaches Development Program alongside the camp, ensuring that the quality of teaching and coaching at this camp is second to none. Please visit headstartbasketball.com or jbilliscamp.com for more information or to get registered. Even at the at the professional level, when I'm working with professional teams, and I'll go back. Uh, last week, I was I was at I was in Chicago, and one of the guys was like, "Can we play zip zap zop, coach?" Yeah, this is a one. grown man <laughs> that is getting paid lots of money to play a game at a level that I just will never achieve. And he's like, "Can we play zip zap zop?" Which is a game that I learned in college. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Like I played it in college, right? <laughs> but like yep. it was just, it, it was great. And so I, I go, yeah, let's do it. And so we play it and it takes about five or six minutes. And then the, I look over at the coach and the coach is thrilled because his players are ready to go. They're ready to play. And so the, adding these activities, just five or six minutes at the beginning of practice, gets the athletes something to look forward to gets them a way to kind of shift their mindset from the drudgery of all the stuff that they did before and the monotony of school and all this stuff. And, you know, school's great. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not great. <laughs> right. But, Understood. But it's just, as adults, we forget what it was like to be sitting in those hard seats all day and all the, the temptations and the distractions. And I'm on this, uh, I have this unhealthy obsession with Mr. Rogers. And I have for years. And I, the, the thing that I love him about him the most is that he never forgot what it was like to be a child. He, he always was able to look at the world through the eyes of a child. And as coaches, we have to remember what it's like to be an athlete and that these are not professional athletes getting paid to play a sport. These are kids with families and problems. And their sport is a lot of times their escape from all the stuff that's happening outside of the court. Yeah, it's so true. I know you had a story. I can't remember which one, which where I read it or which coach notes it was part of, but you talked about a time when you were coaching, I think it was a girls' youth basketball team, and you were debating whether or not to work on a press breaker or have some birthday Yeah, cake. so it was, it was my birthday. It was February 12th, and we were we – were it was a sixth grade girls basketball team. And we got about half an hour into practice and we took a water break. And I'm sitting there and I'm talking to uh, my assistant and they came in, the parents came in with cupcakes and wanted to like celebrate my birthday. And I really needed to put in the press break that week because I knew the team we were going to play on Saturday was going to press us like crazy. And... I sat down with the girls and I was like, hey, this is great. I'm so appreciative. I, I know that we have some stuff that we need to learn. Do you guys want to, like, let's get back to practice. And I could just see on their face that they just wanted to hang out with their coach. And so I said, you know what? Hey, let's just hang out. And so for the rest of the practice, we sat there and the girls, they told they taught me about these games that they played in, in school. And some of them were talking about their teachers and, and they, they had so much fun. Now, we didn't install the press break, but the next day at practice, they were so excited to be at practice. Like it was, it was like, it, it kind of, they looked forward to it and uh, I was able to install a little bit, but I talked to them. I talked to two of them about three years ago and uh, it was, what was funny is I told it. So I told the story through a coach note and then a uh, junior um, English teacher responded and said two of the girls from your store are in my class right now and so the, that coach facetimed me and i got to talk to those two girls which was really cool because i was living in a different state and they brought up that story of coach you remember when it was your birthday and we brought you cupcakes and you hung out with us like that's all they wanted to talk about we didn't talk about the, the 
the, the games we won or lost. We didn't talk about anything. They were just like, do you remember that coach? I said, yes, I remember that. It was awesome. And it reminded me that 10 years down the road, when these kids are adults and they come and talk with us, they're not going to talk to us about the wins and losses. They're going to talk to us about the things that matter the most to them. And it's about connection and being with those athletes in a way where they look up to you and you can speak life into them and you can show them an example, a positive example of how to be an adult. Yeah, the most important thing that I think people remember when you go back and I think about my own athletic career, you talk to the number of people that we've talked to on the podcast and you ask them about, hey, what's your favorite memory from playing your sport in high school? Or what do you what do you remember about your athletic career? And inevitably what they say is not, oh, I remember we won this championship game here. It's it's they remember their teammates or they remember this bus ride or they remember, yep. you know, a team <laughs> meeting or they remember a conversation that they had with a coach. And it's really just like we talked to a guy last night, Lee Wimberly, who's a coach in Arkansas, high school basketball coach. And I asked him sort of the same question that I asked you to start off. Like, hey, how did you get into the game of basketball as a kid? What was your athletic background like? And he was going through and he was talking. And at one point he said when he was he was a baseball player growing up. And then as he got into high school, he sort of transitioned, still played baseball, but basketball became his thing. And he got a, they got a new basketball coach at his high school when he was in ninth grade. And the first thing he said was, you know, this coach came in and – what I remember is he spent time with me, you know, didn't say, Hey, this guy was great at teaching me how to shoot a jump shot, or this guy really knew his X's and O's and he helped our team win. What he remembered was this guy spent time with me. And there's, there's nothing I think more powerful to hear as a coach than a story like that, where sometimes we do get caught up in the X's and O's. We get caught up in the wins and losses and, and every coach does it. I mean, those things hang with you. If you coach, I don't care if you're coaching third graders or you're coaching the Chicago Bulls, every game is important to you and you get caught up in it. But it's really, really important to remember that your athletes, as you said, are coming at it from a different perspective, especially at a younger age. They're, you know, they're much more focused on the fun aspects and the connections and being with their friends and all those kinds of things. And it's important as, as adults that we remember and recognize those situations and that just made me think hey there you know this guy spent time with him and that's what matters you know, that's what matters yeah absolutely you nailed it all right so the other thing that uh that i like that i've done uh that, that you've used before is sort of your beginning of the season activity where you have the kids write down characteristics of what a great teammate would be and i believe your team was called the sons that you wrote the article about oh yeah yeah <laughs> um and i've used that now Pretty much every, ever again, ever since I learned of the activity, I've done it with pretty much every team I've coached. And then what I've done with my AAU basketball teams, with my own kids, is I've put together little notebooks. And then that sheet that the kids sign and write down some characteristics of great teammates, that's always the cover sheet of the notebook that we put together as we do little lessons throughout the season. So just talk a little bit about how you came up with that, why you came up with it, and why you think it's so important and has such a big influence on teams that you've been able to coach. Yeah, uh, I love that you use that. That that happened kind of uh, accidentally. I was with uh, actually the same cupcake team. So that was the Suns. Uh, we we had a we had like a day where it was kind of built in, which is kind of cool for the YMCA to do this, but it was built in a team building day. So you had about an hour with the, your new team to kind of figure out what you wanted to do and what, who you wanted to be. And I just had this blank piece of paper and I said, describe to me in one word what a great teammate is. And so I went through each girl and then they all gave me a word and I wrote them down. And, and then I turned it around and I said, does everybody agree that these would be, that this would be a great teammate? And they all said, yeah. And I said, well, let, how about this? If you commit to being these things, then there's a section here at the bottom sign your name and that means that you agree that this is what we're going to be as the sons and they loved it and they were all signing their names and i gave them different colors and stuff and then we had that and i said okay uh we need a we need a, a cheer we need to yell no idea is dumb what do you got and they just started throwing things out here and there and then uh someone just said fun in the sun I'm like that's it here we go. <laughs> so then every time we broke for anything, it was like, here we go. Let's get a break. One, two, three, fun in the sun. And that was our thing. 
fun in the sun. And uh, all year long, I had that paper, that same exact paper uh, on the back of my clipboard, except it was like a, a see-through clipboard. And so then I flipped the paper over. So whenever I was writing something on the clipboard, the girls could see that. And it was a constant reminder to be a good teammate. And so they would police each other. If somebody was being selfish and we would talk at the end of practice and be like, all right, uh, is there anything that we need to talk about? Is there any themes from this uh, from this paper that we're, we're lacking? And as sometimes somebody would be like, you know, I feel like as a team we're being selfish. Well, okay, great, let's talk about that. And so then that would be our talk, that, that post-practice talk. Instead of me saying, giving this dissertation on why we need to work harder, the, one of the girls said, we, oh, we're being selfish. It's like, okay, well, let's solve that right now. And so it gave us stuff to talk about at the end of practice to develop us as a team instead of me just throwing out, let me tell you a story about Vince Lombardi. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. we're just like, what? Like, let's talk about us because that is, that's the most important thing to the kids is like, what, what's going on with us? How are we growing? Do you see me coach? Do you, did you see me do this thing? Am I, am I getting better? Have you noticed that those are the kind of things that these kids, they want to hear from us. And it comes from them. I think that too is powerful that it's not a coach pontificating about, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what a great teammate is. And certainly we can share those things. But when it comes from the kids know, like I just did it with my fourth grade daughter's team this year. And they made a list of like, I don't know, I think we had, I had each group do, I think I had each group do six and there were a couple overlaps, but we ended up with, I think, eight characteristics of a great teammate. And they're all ones that I would have come up with if it was me sharing it. But here's a group of fourth grade girls who have limited experience in sports. And they came up with a great list of eight. And now, to your point, I've got that sheet. We look at it. We talk about it. When things happen, we can say, hey, did we agree that this was going to be something we're going to do? Well, then we need to do that. And then you get those conversations going. It's just, it's a really, really powerful activity that, Again, it takes almost no time at all. I mean, I took 15 minutes on the very first practice to send them into two groups and talk and write their things down. And then I put it onto a form. You know, I typed it up once we had all those things together and then had them all sign it. And now they've all got their own copy. I've got my copy and everybody, everybody has it. And I always laugh because coming up with this, coming up with the little cheer is is hilarious especially the younger they are because then the longer those cheers the longer those cheers get uh Which so is great. Our, yeah it's it's funny i'm like i don't know if we can say that 27 word cheer you know at, every time we're breaking a breaking a huddle so we might want to shorten that i like the idea so ours this year is one two together three four forever which i thought was pretty i thought that was pretty solid uh, so it's fun. And then, then they all fight over who gets to say the numbers. So we have one person, you know, we pick one person who does the numbers and then everybody else does the other stuff. They're like, I got to say the numbers, got to say the numbers. So again, it keeps them engaged. It's fun. They love it. And it's something that they're going to, they're going to remember. And that's really what it's all about for sure. I love what you said. It, it took 15 minutes. And that's the argument that I get in with these coaches that are like, yeah, but those 15 minutes, we got to do, we got to do a layup drill. That's so important to their development as a human. It's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's really not because, and, and it happens even at the professional level. I'll walk in and like these coaches will bring me into audit practice and be like, how can we be more efficient? And, you know, I mean, we're in basketball season. So if I'm going in and working with a basketball team and I see them at the end of practice shoot around for 15 minutes. Well, first, if they don't have music on, then it's, it's really boring. But if they do have music on, now the players are kind of dancing. It's like, how is that practice, that shot, making you better? Those, you, If you're not being intentional about those shots and you're just shooting for 15 minutes, it's not actually helping. It might actually be a detriment to your shot because you're being lazy about it. Right. And so those 15 minutes that are so precious that we just ha we can't do these activities because we're wasting time, you've got it twisted, is that you're going to get a more focused athlete by being intentional about putting them in, them in the mindset to be able to do those fu fundamentals, to be able to do those routine uh, activities during practice of the layup and the basketball dribble and all this other stuff. If they're not mentally there and they're kind of mentally checked out, well, they're not really you know building any myelin in the muscle memory and they're not really getting any better. And so take a couple minutes, get them in the right mindset. 
and then become a better basketball team. And we all know that the science says that if players are more connected with each other and with their coaches, that not only is that a positive for them as human beings, but it also oftentimes translates to more success on the scoreboard, which, you know, the coaches are presenting that argument to you against it. That's what they're concerned about that. Oh, you know, if we take time to do that, we're missing out on this skill development work or this, you know, this team stuff that we got to get done. And ultimately it pays off in spades, both in terms of the impact that you have on your players, but also I think it ends up having a positive impact. There's plenty of science out there that says that it also has a positive impact on the scoreboard. And I think that's where all coaches, I think we're much better at it as a coaching profession than we were 15 or 20 years ago. I think there's just so much more information out there about how important this stuff is. And I think you are on the front line of it. You're seeing people that are starting to, you know, who maybe 10 years ago would have, 10 years ago would have kind of, you know, sloughed it off and said, ah, I'm not sure. Now, at least those people are starting to look at it and say, hey, maybe this is something that I got to think about and consider. And it's, I think it's just made sports and, and coaching, it's made it a much more positive environment for the players who are playing the games. Yeah, there, you touched on a lot of good things right there. There's two things that build connection. And you can be very intentional about building connection between players. Great teams have two things. They have a shared language. So I could yell uh, a state and a number and the kids know this is the play we're going to run. Like, and they, So they have that shared language. But the other thing is they have inside jokes. And those are so important as the group to bring teams together. And they can save your team. So I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I was at uh, I was at IMG, and there was I was working with girls soccer, and one of the players uh, was a, an example in one of my activities. We did this improv game, and she said something about a purple duck, and that purple duck, like it became this like funny thing. Anytime somebody would say it, everybody would laugh. So the next day, we were on the soccer pitch. And one of the girls was about, she just got annihilated by a, uh, an opponent. Just knocked down totally intentionally to take her out. And this girl got up with this, like she was seeing red. She was ready to murder this other person. And she starts walking towards that person and then starts jogging. And now she's in a full sprint because the girl had gone to the other side of the field. And one of the players on the bench stood up. And I'm sitting right there. She stood up and screamed at the top of her lungs. Purple duck. <laughs> and I watched this girl who was about to get kicked out of the game for <laughs> retribution, right? Going after, and she stopped in her tracks, looked over at Tate and smiled, turned around and went to her spot. It completely changed the course of the game because, you know, this player didn't get, get a red card, didn't get kicked out, all because of a stupid activity that we played the day before. It saved them, and so and that that became their their way to de-escalate tension the rest of the season. Purple duck. It's amazing that the impact of something that it, when you hear that from the outside, you're like, oh, you know, come on, that can't be. And and yet, we all know anybody who's been on a team that there are those little things. There is that shared language. There is that those common bonds that things that you've gone through that everybody remembers that everybody can relate to and i think that's yeah that's so important there's a guy who he is a coach at uh, queen's university in charlotte and we had him on bart lundy and he talked about he creates basically a dictionary of the language for his team and so anybody who's new to the program freshman or somebody who transfers in they get a copy of this team dictionary that has all those shared languages and stories and things that are important in their program and you know again i think that people you know as coaches we we try to communicate those things but a lot of times we do it verbally and i just thought that was very cool that he put it down in writing and that everybody got a copy and he said you know we want it to be we want it to be special we want it to be something that only we share that's not something that there's things that aren't for outside consumption there's things that are only for us and that's what's going to be in this, you know, that's what's going to be in this document, in this, in this dictionary of our program. And I just thought that was a very cool. I'd never heard anybody say that they actually put it down in writing and shared it with everybody who was part of the program. And that kind of goes to exactly what you're talking about. All right. Next thing that I want to talk about, uh, the you, me, we activity, uh, whether it's after practice or after a game, 
to help build up positive team culture. Talk a little bit about what that activity is, because I think that's something that is very easy for coaches to put into place and utilize their team. And I think it's especially, I mean, it's, it's powerful at all levels, but I think it's especially powerful at the youth level where kids sometimes aren't used to talking and aren't used to, aren't comfortable sharing. And I think this gets them out of their shells. Talk a little bit about that activity if you could. Yeah. Well, I was in high school and I was, as a senior, I was on this volleyball team and we had a coach who she was, she was really good at uh, highlighting things that went well during practice. And the way she did it was we would all get in a circle in the middle of the court and she would just seemingly at random point at someone and you had to respond with whatever she asked you. And so the first one she, she would point at someone and said, you, and you, what that person would do is they would have to find someone. So like if she pointed at me and just said, you, I would have to look across the circle and go, you know, Eric right there. I saw how he was hustling today. And I saw that ball that he go for in through the chairs and I was so impressed with you Eric you know well done and then we'd all clap and then she'd go okay uh, Clint and the point at Clint and then if she said your name then you would have to say something that you did good so Clint would be like oh man okay uh, you know I was really tired and uh, I got, got all my serves over and so it's that self-reflection which we are we're in a culture where it's like oh you know be humble and don't share what, what it is you did good, but she would point at you and be like, you know, what did you do good? And you had to, you had to answer. And then the next one, she would point at someone and say, we, and then that person had to say, what as a squad did we do good? So it's, you're focusing on someone else, you're focusing on yourself, and then you're focusing on the squad. Well, after the season, I asked her about it and she showed me this list that she had. She had all of our names on there. And she was actually marking down who she was asking these questions to. So we thought it was random, but she was actually going through so that nobody got left out. That at the end of a few practices, everybody had been pointed at to share what they had noticed about the team. And our morale, I think, was very much tied into that four or five minutes after practice. She wasn't into these post-practice talks and uh, you know, 15 minutes of just, this is what we need to do and here's who we are as a team. It was like, you guys talk. And we did. And we built up each other through that stuff. But what happens is that permeates into practice where we're now allowed to see and celebrate the good things that other players are doing. So I can be like, oh, Clint, dude, that was awesome, bro. I really saw you working hard out there. Eric, you're doing a good job. Hey, as a team, I think we're doing really well. You start focusing on that stuff because what you focus on manifests. And so if you focus on all the negative, you become a very negative team. If you focus on the positive, well, you get the inverse effect. Now you're focusing on the positive and positive things are happening. I also think it gets you out of your shell to be able to talk about those things and feeling comfortable giving a compliment because a lot of times kids just don't feel comfortable pointing out, hey, you know, Susie's doing a really great job or hey, Johnny, boy, he's really working hard. We don't often get those opportunities to praise others. And then a lot of times even – you know, I think about talking about ourselves, you know, we're taught to be humble and there's a lot of, you know, if you watch professional athletes on TV, you know, a lot of times you see kids trying to emulate some of the things that professional athletes do. And that's not really what you want kids doing. You want kids to be thinking about some of those character traits that they're working on, such as, you know, again, I'm working hard or I'm really putting in the effort here and maybe, Maybe I missed five left-handed layups in a row, but I'm shooting every single one with my left hand. And those are the kinds of things that you try to get kids to see and recognize that, hey, I'm really doing a good job at these things. Because a lot of times their confidence, especially with younger kids and even up, you know, all the way through the professional level, it's easy to have your confidence shaken. And sometimes we tend to focus on all the things that we need to do better and we forget about all the things that we do well. And this is a great activity for reminding individuals and the team of, Hey, there are lots of things that we do. Well, I love to use it. I might use it all the time, but I, I love it, especially after losing a game that will do it in sort of the post game, you know, wrap up, we get done and, you know, you go sit off on the side and everybody's talking about it. And so, you know, you're a little down cause you lost the game and all of a sudden you say, okay, who has something nice to say about one of their teammates who saw something nice that, you know, some good that somebody did. And now suddenly hands are shooting up in the air and say, I saw this person do that. I saw her do that. And, 
I saw him do that. And it just makes, it takes what was potentially a negative situation into one where we recognize that maybe the result that we wanted on the scoreboard wasn't there, but we were able to still pick out lots of things that we did well and that we, we can continue to build on so that, you know, the next time we can continue to work and, and get better. And who knows at that point, maybe the, the results will be different on the scoreboard, but it's a, it's just a really good activity. James, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on. We're coming up on about an hour. I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about all the great things that you're doing with Unleash the Athlete. After you left IMG, you went out on your own, started Unleash the Athlete. So I want to give you a chance to talk about that, give people an opportunity to reach out to you, share your contact information, and then I'll jump back on and wrap up the episode. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Unleash the Athlete is what I wish I had when I was an athlete and the resource that I had, that I wish I had when I was a coach. And I, I have some courses up there that are built specifically for athletes to uh, be able to learn from the sports psychology, like you know, goal setting and imagery and self-talk and things of that nature. But also coaches, I have some, some activities up there. Like I have one course, it's 52 team building activities that I Whenever I come across another activity, I just put it on there. So it's like ever evolving, always growing. Uh, I have a mastermind starting up in January for coaches and for athletes. And uh, we're going to be, that's going to be a lot of fun. I've got a lot of athletes signed up. We're basically doing a two hour live teaching session one Sunday a month. And then the coaches are able to log on and get the material and make it their own and teach it to their athletes. And so if you go to UT, athlete.com you'll be able to get that kind of information right there and of course i've got my coach notes so i'm always sending out different stories and articles and stuff uh, on my coach notes and uh, i am pretty active on twitter and instagram both are james leaf my username that's it well any coaches out there listening hopefully it's come across on the podcast how much I have respect for the things that James has done. I've used a ton of his stuff and it all works. I, I haven't found anything that I've tried that James has put out there. That's a lot of pressure. That man. is. Dang, that is. Oh. Wow, but trust all me. All right. Trust me. I'm, 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 up. I'm trying to do the sales <laughs> job. I, I've used, I've, I've used a lot of your stuff. It's very, very practical. It's you. very practical. There are things that you can implement right away. That's going to make the experience better for your kids, for your athletes and for you as the coach. And so I would highly recommend if you don't already subscribe to James's coach notes, get on there and take a look at his classes. The activities and things that he's put together uh, are just tremendous. And I think if we're thinking about how we can better educate coaches and make the experience better for our athletes across all sports, but obviously specifically we're here talking about basketball. There's just so many things that he's done that are applicable. So James, again, we can't thank you enough for being willing to come out with us share some of your time, share some of your activities, and just continue to help grow the game of basketball and to help improve the coaching landscape out there for the athletes that are a part of it. So to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. As you've listened to the Hoop Heads podcast, one common topic that continually comes up in our conversations is character. I'm fortunate to be associated with the Positive Coaching Alliance, a national nonprofit movement that provides valuable tools, training, and resources for coaches, athletes, parents, and administrators that is centered around sports and educational psychology and organizational behavior research. PCA combines this research with practical advice from a national advisory board of top pro and college athletes and coaches who utilize PCA principles at the highest levels of competition. Through a partnership with our local Cleveland chapter of the PCA, we are pleased to offer a discount code to allow you, our listeners, to take a PCA online course for just $20. To take advantage of this offer, visit the store on positivecoach.org and enter the discount code HOOPHEADS20. That's HOOPHEADS20 with two capital H's. Coaches, I hope you'll take advantage of this great offer from the Positive Coaching Alliance and help us continue to grow the game. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.